to The Truth in His Art. I am your host, Rob Lee. Thank you for tuning in to my conversations at the intersection of arts, culture, and community. Do remember to leave a review, subscribe, share, help us get the word out there. You know, we're battling algorithms. We're battling that everyone's a podcaster now, but these stories are important and it being shared um, is just really huge. Um, every guest that comes on, have an opportunity to share them their story in an authentic fashion in their words, and those stories are very important. Uh, This is an archive of nearly 800 episodes. So um, at least at this point, I'm not sure when you're going to be listening to it, but um, yeah, just definitely your support matters. It means a whole lot for us here at the uh, the, the Truth in This Art, and your support uh, continues to have us putting out these episodes at this rate and uh, to this degree. So again, thank you, and your continued support means so much. And in terms of support, I want to give a big shout out and a thank you to the Robert W. Deutsch Foundation, who is um, supporting a big chunk of this season um, financially. They're, they sent us a grant and we're, we're working with that to uh, produce uh, this season's episode. So again, thank you to the Robert W. Deutsch Foundation. And without much further ado, I want to get into the day's um, interview. My next guest is an editorial comic artist who holds degrees in studio art and comics um, and is known for his work in Hyperallergic and The Margins. Please welcome Greg C.M. Campbell. Welcome to the podcast. Hello. Hello. Hi, Rob. How you living? Man, I'm living in mansions and credit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's what I want to hear. <laughs> yeah. See, generally when I, when I do the interview, right? I start off and someone's wearing glasses. I always acknowledge that, but I'm starting to get to that stage because I'm committing to the beard that shout out and thank you for having a beard, brother. <laughs> yeah, you got to rock it when you got it. You know, you know how many kids in Somalia could use a beard right now? <laughs> That's good. That's good. So, you know, starting off, um, one thing, and I'm, and I'm glad we were able to chat a little bit before going into this. And even before we get into sort of the, the deeper questions, um, I want to get, you know, sort of your introduction of yourself and your work in your own words. Like, who's Craig C.M. Campbell? Uh, as far as my work is concerned, uh, I'm a cartoonist. Uh, I feel like I, I stand 10 toes deep on that one. Uh, I am a cartoonist, uh, a storyteller. Um, I do write. I uh, do illustration. I uh, do uh some organizing, some programming uh, for CXC. There are a bunch of things that I do. I do what I can uh, when I can, uh, but I am a self-identified cartoonist. I make comics and tell stories. That is essentially the way I see myself on a professional level. Thank you. It's 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 important to get it directly from the person. We have these glossy sort of uh, online bios and so on. I've I've seen what I do written as something that doesn't seem like I can identify with it. I say, I don't know. That's what I, I use the term word wizard, but, uh, you know, and everyone doesn't throw that out there. Man, I, I learned how to write an artist statement. So I know how to, uh, expound <laughs> <laughs> on what it is I do and how I think. And, um, it's like I could read it and you'd be like, man, that's deep. I'm like, I draw pictures of people. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's like, um, you know, when you have those resume parsers, it's almost like you got to have the artistic one. And it's like, did you put spaces in there and these different terms? And it's like, no, I didn't. <laughs> um, so uh, one of the biggest influences in terms of my understanding of art was Hennessy Youngman. Those <laughs> Hennessy Youngman videos. Uh, and because the thing about it, it was really something that broke down that a part of being an artist is to be um, <clears throat> pretentious and kind of play a role. I do consider myself pretentious. I am a person who likes to project value onto things I know I know have no inherent value. And I think the the grounding thing in uh, engaging with pretension is being self-aware enough to know there is no inherent value. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's projected value. And so if I could convince you that something is worth something, then I, I feel like I've given you something, you know? But before we got started, you said you weren't a salesman. <laughs> I ain't selling nothing. I'm just giving you something. <laughs> ain't nobody paying me for it. That's the problem. We paying time, brother. <laughs> yes. You paying so, attention. 
So this this sort of like this is a sort of two part follow up question to that introductory one. So earliest creative memory, like you know, was it comics related? Was it storytelling related? Um, talk a bit about one of those really like early memories that stick out for you. Yeah, I, I could actually pinpoint the single memory uh, that sticks sticks out. Um, uh, my sister, uh, shout out Opal. Uh, she had me and my brother Greg. Uh, shout out my parents for naming us Craig and Greg. Uh, <laughs> we were uh, she was babysitting us, and uh, what she would do to get us to just calm down is draw out of uh, comic strips in the newspaper. And so my first memory was uh, her doing this and having a drawing contest where me and my brother would draw uh, Odie from Garfield. Nice. And so my first drawing that I remember is a drawing of Odie in competition with my brother as my sister was trying to babysit us. And so that was comic memory one, art memory one. Uh, it wasn't Dennis the Menace. It wasn't the Calvin and Hobbes. I don't think Calvin and Hobbes was a thing back then. Might have been. But it was Garfield. So what? And, and that's and that's great to have have that because um you know comic strips right we we have those we have those as those sort of reference points is like when you get that newspaper I remember back in the day you know not too too long ago as we were talking about um you know that year before forty as it were uh you know I I would go pick up like the newspaper for my mom and I'm like yeah I'm gonna already pre extract this comic section because I'm gonna need that yep. <laughs> Yeah. And it'd be one of those things on Sunday. It's all in color. What? I mean, I would say that like uh, comic strips have been a huge part of what I do. I remember um, I'm drawing at this time. This is in high school. Uh, but one of the things that I would do is uh, when I was in high school is when Boondocks came out. Yeah. And I didn't realize this until much later in, in life that like I started reading on the third strip. It was the Star Wars episode one strip. Uh and so actively, I was like, how long has this been out? I don't know, because uh, I'm not as well versed on the Internet because the Internet isn't as big of a thing right now. Right. Um, but I remember being religious about just reading boondocks every day in study hall, just boondocks. And so I remember that being huge, uh, uh, especially because I, I, I lived uh, north of Chicago, mm -hmm. like Evanston. And uh and so living in Evanston and then moving to Skokie and having like when I was much younger, lived in Chicago, uh, there was this relationship that I had with that story where you had uh, black kids who moved to the suburbs and had to engage. And um, I think that I related to that because at that age, because I, I, actually, it's, that's a fun question. How old was Huey? You know? I don't know. I, yeah. I assume like eight, you know, sure. I relate to that, that, that character a lot. So, um, I don't know that comic strip brought me back to where I needed to be. That's, that's, that's great. Uh, you know, when we have, we have those things like I, you know, I've mentioned on this podcast before that I wanted to be a comic artist when I was younger. That was, that was the thing that I was into. And I thought that was going to be the path. It was not, uh, but I thought it was going to be the path. And, um, and I would, when, when, when folks might ask, um, like, so what, what were you drawing? I was like, look, these are just ripoffs of like Wildcats and X-Men. These are unbashed ripoffs. So, you know, but those were, my, those were my influences. Those were the things that were interesting to me. I wanted to be around a covert action team. And for you, what, what sorts of like comic or, or art, you know, and maybe have a delineation between the two, you know, as far as like there's that fine art side and then there's sort of that, that comic side. Not to say that one is better than the other, but there are two different lanes. What – what were your what were the things you were into growing up? Was there a certain artist that you really liked growing up? Was there a certain, you know, presentation? Was there a certain style of art that you were really into growing up? Um, that's a, a really good question. You know, I feel like I, I thought of the previous ones you mentioned, I had the stories down. Um, as far as comics, by the time I was in high school, when I wasn't reading the boondocks, I remember I was huge into spawn, image comics had just come out. Um, and I was really not like reading, reading, like I read comic strips, but I wasn't reading comic books. Yeah. I, it was just dr books full of drawings and I would copy things out of those drawings, out of those books and draw. Um, but I wasn't really reading them and following them. Uh, but I would just buy random comics yeah. off the shelf. I wouldn't follow in stories or anything like that early on. Um, as far as art, fine art, hmm. 
I think I was just taking it. Oh, do you know what? Honestly, I was huge into like, like graffiti, like tagging. Uh, like my favorite movie at that time was like Star Wars. My brother just got two turntables and like he was collecting records and I couldn't, I was allowed to touch them, you know, <laughs> but I couldn't, I couldn't play with them, you know? <laughs> um, at that time, music was huge for me. So like a lot of, I remember I was really into trying to like draw these logos. Like I thought like, like the Def Squad had the dopest logo. Cause you remember yes. the Def Squad had the three blocks. Yeah, yeah. I thought so, so Def had the worst logo on earth. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, what is these Afro puffs? <laughs> yeah, no, no hate on Jermaine Dupri, but like actively, I would just look at these logos because there was a hip hop aesthetic, but there was a refinement as far as an illustrative approach that I found really engaging. Uh, and so I had comics, I had illustration that caught my eye that I kind of clung to. I remember often uh, kind of having a relationship between graffiti that I would see in books, like, you know, the you would see the Polaroids of like full, like buses stacked up and walls and things like that. Um, I can't even remember the name of the magazines, uh, like, uh, but I would relate those to like uh, album covers I would see where like, I would write out names and do like textual things yeah. and like, like draw these things that I felt like were iconic. Uh, so that ended up being something I remember really clinging on to, like copying comics and making up logos. I, and I don't even know how, what I was going to do with it. I don't know what I was thinking. I just thought it was cool, I guess. But no, yeah. that, that's that's really dope. Like, you know, I had this this period where I used to try to draw the covers of Wizard Magazine. That was okay. that's the lane I was in. And I'm in my home studio now, and we're all so fortunate, but I'm in my home studio now and I keep all of my sort of like creative stuff in here, whether it be when I did this painting thing for six months, eight years ago, I just wanted to do a painting one per month, what have you, just as a challenge. And, you know, my comics in here as well, all my DVDs, and I'm looking at one right now, one painting right now that is clearly I'm inspired by, um, what is it, Low End Theory. You know, so okay, okay. sort of the color scheme and sort of what I was taking from it. And the kicker is I may have seen that cover one time. And I was like, these are the colors I'm going to use. This is the aesthetic I'm going with and put this this thing out there. And I was like, no, I saw this in my mind's eye and I put it out there and it's directly connected to hip hop. It was directly connected to that, that sort of album. And even a, a note on sort of the hip hop branding component, like if you saw like a public enemy jacket, or something yep. with that logo on the back or anything in that vein, like the branding component of hip hop stuff, it definitely lended itself to, I need to make that. Well, and I would say as far as hip hop, uh, hip hop gave uh, this narrative of one thing. Uh, I think when you're looking at something like Style Wars, the idea of making art for the sake of art, you yeah. know, you are tagging the side of a train because you want somebody from another borough to see your name going through their neighborhood. But the other thing is hip hop kind of created this thing where this idea of monetization, because mm -hmm. that's when Fat Farm was coming out. That's when Sean John was coming out. That's when every uh, hip hop artist had a record label yeah. and you began to kind of connect to an aesthetic. And I think like right now, now that we brought up logos, I think part of what I was thinking about was like. I was thinking about the fashion and the aesthetics of hip hop yeah. and how that could be something that was monetized. And so logos and things like that became huge. Um, and so like, I was never illustrating full scenes. I was never like, I'm thinking about a single image right now of like a, like a face that was kind of a Looney tune, like, yo, all right, I'm jumping on a tangent. You might catch me doing this every once in a while. Good, Sounds like I'm but uh, you remember those t-shirts with, uh, <laughs> Bugs Bunny and Don and and Daffy Duck, yeah, like full hip hop attire. Yeah, like like I would draw drawing. things like that. Yeah, I remember uh, iceberg sweaters. My dad brought bought me an iceberg sweater with Linus, and that was like people at school, like well, black people at school <laughs> lost their minds. <laughs> so it's all, and, it's all, oh, that's that's funny. It's funny because. Um, my brother's name is Rudy. So when that iceberg joint came out, he was like, yo, I need everyone. Yeah. 
Yeah, so actively, I remember Iceberg being a big deal, and you wanted cartoons on your clothes. You wanted that uh, intellectual property to be present on all your attire, it, especially because it was refined. Like, I remember that sweater, like, yesterday, and it was just, like, a tan sweater with, like, blue text and, like, Linus on profile with yeah. over his shoulders. And so, like, this, like, cartoons were very engaged with hip-hop at that time. Maybe it was Space Jam. I don't know. Maybe it was Maybelline. Who knows? So nice, nice. There, there, there was a little known show. And this, this is a thing, right? This is a, almost a scene checking thing, because um, because because of that that sort of connection. You're really on point there. Uh, I remember I was really big into MTV when they did the animation blocks, right? And yeah. they had this one joint that was the hip hop equivalent to Beavis and Butthead, and I believe it was called Station Zero, and it was oh. like. It didn't last long, but I used to watch that in the morning. And, you know, I think these were guys that were like in New York or what have you. And it it worked. It worked for whatever reason. And it was sort of that this is this has that hip hop equivalent. And I remember at a point they tried to do an animated version of Friday. I remember that as well. I'm, yo, you, you're schooling me right now. The animated version of Friday. I believe that don't was talk the, about that. It was on it. it they don't want to hear about that. <laughs> they, I'm ready for that conversation. <laughs> but yeah, I, I see when that, that crossover is there. And, and sort of last thing that I'll, I'll say in it as far as the commercialization, the monetization of it, it's just like you have this hip hop thing, you have that aesthetic. And when it crosses over into like video games, like when you have, uh, what is it? Um, Def Jam, Fight for New York, Vendetta and all of that stuff. It's just like they almost have like their logos in there. <laughs> There, there was, I think, hip hop present in even like Toe Jam and Earl, like had a hip hop energy to it. Like there was a weird time when, uh, when Fred and Barney were rapping for a Free Pebbles commercials dressed like Run DMC. Sure. <laughs> like actively, there, like hip hop was permeating in a way that it doesn't now. Because yeah. I think there was a sweet spot. I'm gonna call it the comic spot where people ain't taking you too seriously, and so you could be a little goofy. Yeah. And at this point, like, and also like they like this desire to make sure kids had access to it. And so there was a, a place where you could have a little bit more fun. Like right now, hip hop is maybe a little too sexy, maybe a little too sexy. <laughs> I, I'm not I, even saying like it's violent or nothing. It's like it may be a little too sexy. <laughs> I don't disagree with that. And, you know, I've had this conversation recently. I was like, look, I just I just want the fun thing is. As we're recording this, and, and I'll move into this next question. As we're recording this on, I believe this is Biggie's birthday. You know, is it? Oh. I believe, <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> you know, this is we're recording this May 21st. So I have to really set that stage. You know, right. you know, when people ask me, like, yo, so who are you choosing all of this different stuff? And it's not really a, a conversation about that. And I would say my reasoning, I was like, because it was fun. It, it had a funner sort of thing with it. Yeah. Uh, I think my problem with most media, this is not just hip hop, it's with music, it's with books, it's, it's with art. Uh, I think that this is highlighted in uh, this uh, the recent film, American Fiction. It's more about the narrowing yeah. of what can be, what stories can be told and kind of really locketing, uh, locking in uh, a marketing plan to commit to before actually examining the art that's being created. And so I like the art that's being created. I like the sexy stuff. My issue is that it's so narrow in the scope of what can be made that actively it doesn't allow for a, a, a plethora of stories actively, even though I think that like, I don't know, sex, what, a sexy red, cool, like dope, yeah. but like, I don't want to say there should be a kid in play. Let me think about somebody else. Uh <laughs> I'll, I'll give, I'll give you this sort of thing. I, I think this is when you were describing that sort of the narrowing of it. I immediately thought of the video for Socket to me, the Missy Elliott oh. joint where it's like, they're dressed like media man or what have you. And I was like, this is fire. That's the thing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's a great, like, there was a point in the time, in time where you had, uh, the Buster Rhymes video, which was goofy, silly, and fun. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was right next to, you know, like a Wu-Tang video, which might've been like super, like, like we are in an alley shooting a video. Yeah. So uh, like the seriousness, the tone, there was a diversity. And I wouldn't say that there was there was still crossover. You could still see a collab with Busta Rhymes and ODB. Yeah. There wasn't this complete segregation of the fun. You know, like even the fact that like Wu-Tang is a great example because like 
like one cannot question the credibility of the Wu-Tang Clan, but also you can't question the nerd cred of the Wu-Tang Clan. Yeah. Like actively they are, they exist in that way. And that's yeah. something that I think we need more of personally. That's my opinion. I think it exists. I just think that there needs to be more light sh shone, shined, yeah. sh shunned on, <laughs> on that. <laughs> I, I, I'll say this. I had a Wu-Tang Clan pendant on my joint back in the day. That's the necklace I had, me and my brother, because our actual last names begin with a W. So I was like, yes, yeah, for that. And it's like, that's the Wu right there that you're wearing, brother. It's like, don't you worry about that. <laughs> so I want to move into sort of this question about um, CMC Comics. What was the inspiration um, in starting that? Was it Was it driven, and I think it's a good sort of spot based on what we were just touching on, was it driven by sort of a lack of outlets? What what was the driver behind it that were, you know, that kind of inspired that that creation? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think that's nail on the head. I don't want to overcomplicate it actively, um, despite the fact that I, I felt my work uh, was of quality. And there were times where I had different discussions about my work, um, uh, where my work was pitched. Um, and uh, I would get feedback about my work uh, from different publishers. And either it was like an aesthetic needs to be changed when everything was very specifically pointed um, or a uh, narrative element was um, something that wasn't reflective of what was popularized. Um, I felt like no one was going to make my work. And I, I could be right. I could be wrong. Who knows? Maybe I'm delusional. Maybe I was immature. Maybe my work wasn't up to par. But actively, I felt like as far as looking at the way a lot of market systems work, there's a uh, there's a saying that uh, I, I've heard. I don't know if this is like a fun thing, but like uh, it's like uh, why is so hot right now? Why is super hot right now? I think of like Zoolander right now. Yeah. Like, you know, it's so hot right now. <laughs> Like the idea that there was a point in time where I was very willing to engage with criteria and that I would make work in the framework of that criteria. Sure. But actively, it didn't reflect a perspective that somebody wanted. Right. And I'm like, well, I don't fully understand. These are a list of things that you said to hit. And it was like, well, that's off. And I've talked to people about Black media and uh, the scope of Black media and what can be said, what can be done. Um, I don't think there's nearly as much explore, uh, exploration in media. Sure. I think most people, right now, it's difficult to market a lot of things. I mean, looking at publishing, what, uh, last I checked, I think this is an article that came out in 2021. Uh, I believe it said that 49% uh, of book sales are not new books. Mm -hmm. And that number had shifted, it like had gone up from like 10 years prior. And so it becomes harder and harder to penetrate an industry that everybody is backlogged on where they got to catch up on their reading. Everybody's catching up on the reading. You know, everyone got books from 2018. They haven't touched it. Um, and so that, that, that makes it harder to sell books. And when an industry is suffering a lot of changes, riskier bets become less viable. Mm -hmm. With that in mind, I'm not like mad, you know, I'm not like bitter or anything about it, but I understand that there may not be a space currently available for me to tell the stories I want to tell. And so actively creating CMC comics was kind of my avenue to do that. And uh, I, I also currently have a friend that the only other person that is, you know, publishing under that moniker in some way is uh, my friend Adam Roberts, who is currently incarcerated and makes work that we correspond with. And so being able to table his work and share his work with people have been uh, a really big deal for me. So um, there are just things that I want to see in the world. And um, like, I don't, I, it's yet been presented to me an avenue to do that in a way that I, I could re respect what I was doing or enjoy what I was doing. And so, you know, sometimes you've got to treat it like crochet. You just make, <laughs> just make. No, no, that, that's, that's great. I mean, we I think we're on the, the, the same page when it comes to that. Um, and, and thank you for, 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 for walking us through because, you know, I, I've recently 
dri- uh, dove back into uh, the Death of the Ar- the Artist uh, book that I've read before, and I'm diving back in. And he's literally touching on that, that thing that you're saying as far as the original sort of work. And we want these things that aren't as risky, that that are wins. And, you know, I have sort of this East Coast perspective that's, you know, I I, I like how you were describing it. Mine's is a little bit more rough around the edges, a little bit more Wu-Tang, Gritty Alley. Yeah. But it's literally like I have this thing like, you know, dudes in suits don't have taste. And, okay. I, and I try not to be completely, but I'm, I don't think I'm too far off in that. I don't quite get it or it's this or it's that or even when specifically when it comes to I've gone to cons I go to a lot of cons right and I see people with their work and like I said I'm interested in comics I'll buy people stuff and you see a dude and like your work kind of looks like you guys are using the same prompt like this is giving me real mid journey right now but then when the pitch comes there because it's personal selling like I've bought a bunch of books that it's just to support the person Yes. And then I might check it and read it. But I go to any of these cons with like two to $300 to try to one network, but two yep. also, I'm just like, I'm going to buy a book. I'm gonna buy a couple of books. And, you know, I asked, I was like, tell me about the work. And it's like, man, so you like star Wars, right? And I was like, D- dude, don't, <laughs> don't give me something like what makes yours. I don't want Afro star Wars. I, <laughs> you know, give me something that feels unique. That's the selling point. Like I'm here. I'm talking to you. So there's a certain short, <laughs> you know, shorthand, nerd shorthand. You know what I mean? Uh, actually, it's it's interesting. So um, I have <laughs> like a 45 minute lecture on the concept of originality. Uh, shout out to all my students who heard that lecture. <laughs> uh, I know how to summarize it. I'll say it real quick. Uh, <laughs> when it comes to the question of originality, I think of originality the same way I think about style. It's none of my concern. Like, it's it's like, I don't think an artist can, like, a, a professor of mine uh, once told me, she said, you're only as original as your references are obscure. The fact is that, like, if you want to be original, what that means, you need to go to a library. You need to go watch public access TV from 1980. I could recommend some wild deep cuts. You need to catch Nick at Night. And go read some books that nobody ever read. And then whatever comes out of your face, people will be like, what are you talking about? That's so original. You're so special. Uh, but, but like actively, uh, <laughs> like originality to me is not the point. My, my question for you, like when people are like, it's my style, I want to make something original. If originality is your goal, if developing a style is your goal, actively you are trying to do something that is inevitable and going to happen. Um Uh, Kurt Vonnegut once said uh, about writing nonfiction versus uh, science fiction. He said, don't worry about writing, writing about yourself. It's going to happen anyways. Your voice is going to penetrate who you are as an individual. You can't help the fact that you are the only person who is like you. And bridging the gap is not about originality. Bridging the gap is finding a language that can connect you with other people. And usually you have to do that through unoriginal means. That's why we need genre tropes. That's why we need genre conventions. That's why we need uh, things to bridge gaps. And so your your originality, how original you are, is about, to me, honesty and vulnerability. If you are vulnerable and you are honest about who you are, people will both relate to you and bridge a gap between themselves and where you're at. And that is the sense of originality that they're getting, that you are original. You are, your existence is original. You are your style, you are original. Everything else is just bridging a gap between what's in here and what's out there. I think that's, that's pretty solid, that, that, one, five, one four, five minutes. I mean, that was tight, that was tight. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's like, it's like that thing where it's like, you know, what's that, that famous quote that Bruce Lee joined is my style is no style, that whole thing. Yeah. It, it's, it's a version of it. And when I, you know, like, you know, I dove back into, cause you know, the references, right. You know, have the, you know, the Austin Cleon stuff and all of that. And it was like, oh, this is just gentleman thievery. And that's just what it is. It's just like, these are my references. And I look at some obscure stuff and it's just like, and, 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 it, and it, I'm, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this. You know, we were talking about the Wu-Tang earlier, right? And the Wu-Tang, how old am I? But we were talking <laughs> about it earlier. And, you know, you get the nerd thing because you know your people when you hear like, yo, I'm like Big John Stud, my middle name Mud. It's like, you're, wrest- you're referencing wrestling. 
And it's like, right? you're a nerd. Well, and, and I think that's what really connects with the Wu is actively they are human beings. Like they are so human mm-hmm. in their engagement. And what makes them human is the fact they are not like 100% hardcore all the time. They are like when you hear like a, a lot of rappers would say some wild nerd shit, then it was just like it would bridge this gap because they were consuming the same media you were consuming. You know, one of my favorite stories uh, about like genres, uh, I love subgenres. I, I'm, I'm a big fan of genre tropes and all these things, but um, the relationship between um, like wushu films and black exploitation. Mm -hmm. And the fact that it was uh, the fact that Harlem theaters would buy these Shaw Brothers movies and get bad like dubbings of them and play them at the same time as they were playing Shaft. And eventually somebody was like, yo, what we need to do is put some like like Kung Fu in ours and and, like the, the 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 cross pollination like that was original in the most unoriginal way you know what i mean like th- like their inability to uh fully replicate something that they thought was cool yeah. turned into like coffee and it's wild <laughs> that's dope that's dope it's, and, and and i love the as the professor hat comes on and we're like knowledge is being dropped i'm like i hope y'all listening to that oh man it's got some some, some by the way for anybody who doesn't know i'm talking about uh the uh coffee the movie not like a drink <laughs> just for those for the uninitiated <laughs> yeah i was there i was there yeah. with you i was like man yeah. we, you know what i'm saying hey yeah. shout um, out to pam Greer. <laughs> shout out indeed um so I'm, I'm, let's talk about um current work right now recent work um you know let's talk about sort of what that workflow looks like from you know sort of that initial idea to sort of you know that that finished work or near finished work because i know some of you visual types i ain't quite done yet brother i i I like to be fully transparent about what i do and how i do it because actively i mean it is a mess and uh i think that (laughs) I, i hope that like young artists are able to learn from it. I really hope that people could uh, develop both realistic expectations and understand that it is pretty fun and it is pretty cool, but it is like, it's wild. Like I, I like being an independent cartoonist is not a uh, mainstream cartoonist. If you have a comics team where you have your writer, your uh, penciler separate from your inker, separate from your colorist, and you have an editor, who's operating as a project editor and is not your copy editor, who's actually taking care of a lot of the writing and the continuity errors. You have a massive team of people putting out books monthly. All right. So curb your enthusiasm when your favorite cartoonist, when, when you're thinking of Aaron Magruder and you're like, man, why can't he keep making comics? And it's like, because it's exhausting (laughs) after doing it for like 12 years. If somebody wants to stop, you'll know why, because it's their babies. Um, but with that in mind, actively, while I was in uh, New York uh, working with Hyperallergic, doing editorial work, uh, check out my work at Hyperallergic, CM Campbell. Um, but I was also uh, doing a lot of pitches. I was under the expect. I, I, I like the idea of making graphic novels. I'm a huge novel fan. I actively, if if anybody was curious about the 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 shoes I wanted to walk in, it was definitely like. Uh, Ralph Ellison and James Baldwin, like I'm talking about like, you know, 1950s black. That was that was that was the, you know, uh, and so actively I wanted to create uh, black stories without black heroes and create narratives that were about the nuances of uh, race without ever really talking about race directly. Yeah. But like it being uh, so. So I made uh, three books. Uh, one y'all ain't never heard of, and hopefully one day you, you will. I don't mind saying the name. Uh, you can ask me questions about it if you like, but, you know, time. Uh, but it was That Old English. Y'all should check it out. Available online, uh, either at my store at Radio Ada Comics, um, and also uh, uh, Children in Heath, which was about my war experiences. Um, and so both of those are science fiction stories. Um, that deal a lot with uh, race, gender, politics, but also it doesn't necessarily have any like lectures in them. <laughs> there, there's no like uh, like spoon feeding. Yeah. Uh, and the morals are usually conclusions you have to come to on your own. That's how I wanted to tell stories. It was very inspired by the novels that I had read. 
Um, and so I wrote those, pitched those, and I was working at Hyperallergic, got a job in Columbus, Ohio, teaching at Columbus College of Art and Design in the comics department. Shout out to CCAD. And uh, and I, I continue to make those first two books. Yeah. Every issue, I try to do one issue of each a year, and I'm still behind. Uh, <laughs> and it's it's one of those things where I, I continue to engage with teaching, which I love. Yeah. I love teaching so much. Um, I still engage with projects. I, I like collaborating with other artists. I like the times when I could write to write. I like to draw when I can draw. And so I enjoy making comics and I want to continue to enjoy making comics. And if someone was to uh, put me in a situation where I had support, if I had editors, if I had a team behind me to get work out faster, I would put myself in that position. And if I wanted to take the time, like outside of that, I want to enjoy the process and enjoying the process means taking time to win. And uh, that's my workflow. My workflow is I continue to make comics when I'm selling the comics. Usually I'm not making them at the same time. Uh, so if I finish a book, I get it printed. I go through that rigmarole. I am not really making while I'm in the process of editing and printing. And when I am tabling, usually there will be a window of time where I'm not making work for those series or possibly any other series. And if I'm doing a project, it's probably a short term project where it's like I'm doing a 10 page comic, 12 page comic, maybe a part of an anthology or something like that. And so there's a chaotic nature to release dates that I'm sure folks are not happy with, but much love to y'all. The people who, after I'm done with it, who have been born this year <laughs> will appreciate that. <laughs> They'll be like, it's all in one bundle. All my future <laughs> kids, all, all those future kids out there who got to read the whole thing at once. You're welcome. <laughs> it is, it's like the the thing, like I, I do this on occasion, you know, like the whole way that we stream things now. It's like, oh yeah, the first two episodes are available. It's like, nah, I'm going to wait till the season is done. I'm going to get the whole thing. Yeah. Um, I, like uh, inspiration for that, I think a lot of independent artists in the 90s, but the big one was Black Hole. Uh, mm -hmm. Black Hole came out one issue a year uh, over uh, either 10 or 12 years. I used to know off the top of my head, I gave a late lecture about it, but Charles Burns' Black Hole came out in like a large period of time. And it was a really beautiful, like complex work. And to me, like I never read it issue by issue. I know people who have. Yeah. I got to read it from beginning to end. Yeah. One day, someone will read my work from beginning to end. We are not th there yet. Uh, but, you know, they can read my hyperallergic work, so. Yeah, big shout out to Harag as well, because he's been on the- Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, shout out to Harag. <laughs> so tell me about your, like, that, that, that sort of realization, if you will, like, of who you are or who you were, like, that sort of discovery point of, being an artist and, and being a person that ascribes to that, like, I think we constantly sort of check in to what are our interests, like, as, as I'm doing this. I always knew I was a weirdo and I'd ask weird questions. I'm like, yo, tell me about how you bop, 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 and being able to really own that and dive into that and turn it into sort of these these types of conversations that, you know, people seem to like. And with with your work, like, when did you know you were who you were on a path of being who you will become? Um, I think uh, as far as being an artist, I think being an artist is like being an adult. <laughs> when you stop romanticizing it, that's when you know you made it. You know, th th there's no better sign that someone isn't an adult when they say, I'm an adult. I could do things. And it's like, <laughs> are you an adult, though? Are you? Maybe. Um, <laughs> When uh when I was like, oh, oh, I'm an artist, damn it. <laughs> like that's that was when I knew I was an artist. I was like, oh damn it, oh man, this is my job. <laughs> I was an artist before that, but that's when I really knew. <laughs> it's 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 me with the, the, the teaching thing. My my partner was like, You like your kids. I was like, ah she was like, You're a teacher. I was like, ah yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's in the fields. <laughs> you love it, and you know you can't escape it. And you're like, I'm do I'm doing this forever. I guess <laughs> you're like that's what I'm gonna do. And I I think uh, the way I got to that conclusion, um, I think as far as if this is advice for young artists looking for that, um, finishing work. Mm. More work you finish, 
the more you realize that your finished work will not fix your problems or define you. And actively, it was conversation. You finish, like when we're talking right now, right? And mm -hmm. if I say something, you think what I said was dope. It's like, cool. It's not like I could be like, all right, I said the dope thing. Peace out. Like <laughs> you, get, you got the sound bite. Let's go. Uh, actively, it's just the conversation keeps going and you just keep, you keep talking. And when you make work as an artist, you keep making work and it's conversational. And it's not a point where you just stop. You, you continue to engage with work. You see what other artists doing. I love going to comic conventions, seeing what cartoonists are making. I love going to movies with friends and talking about the movie afterwards. I love engaging yeah. with the world around me. And as an artist, I feel like it's our job to take in the world and converse about it and reflect on it and communicate things both textually and non-textually and um, reach uh, more abstract modes of thought because at the end of the day, language is abstract, thought is abstract. You know, there is no inherent value in words, but us as a species have created a way in which we can monetize and create values on thought. And so as artists, that's we're perpetuating that. Um, the value is in our engagement. And so continuing to engage, that doesn't stop. And a finishing a, a piece is like finishing a sentence. Yeah. You know, writing a page, writing a paragraph, writing a book, it's all just one step in a litany of things until you stop. Yeah, I mean, when I'm trying to get this across as a idea, as a, as a concept, as a thing, right? You know, I'll say, and I try not to sound hokey, but I'll, I'll say, you know, this is, you know, an, a, a page in the book that is this podcast journey, or this is a portion of the body of work. And I struggle with, and and, and I want to get your thoughts on, on this. When, like, I do a lot in a volume, like I'm coming up on at this, as we're recording this, five years, but nearly 800 episodes in that five years. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I kind of struggle at times with, you know, wanting to spend more time with it, but there is a driver of got to get these conversations. I dig these conversations. These are great. And trying to balance the two. And I don't feel this way, but it's sort of that one piece of criticism that I haven't heard it, but I think like, is it disposable? You know what I mean? Like what's, what is that value? Cause it's, it's words and all of that stuff. And because you're able to, because I'm able to get so much done and I see people who are able to get a lot of work out and you're like, what's the quality component around it and sort of that, those validation markers that come along with it. So, um, I think it, it goes back to this kind of idea of pretension, uh, me acknowledging the fact that there is no inherent value in the things that I do and say, but my job is to believe and make people believe that there is. Um, I am a weird dude, you know, I don't know what it is, ADHD, autism, whatever that is. Um, but it was later in life that, <laughs> this is gonna sound crazy, that I realized people talk for fun. <laughs> like, I, like I thought that communication was purely functional. And I realized most people just talk shit. And this is it. Just talk shit. It's not about the exchange of information all the time. Sometimes it's just talking shit. And so creating a hierarchy in talking shit versus like, like it's something that as I've gotten older, I've put less weight into like, who's being like, who's telling a fart joke and who's enlightening me. You know what I mean? And so like at the end of the day, sometimes people like, my question comes down to, are we hurting anybody? Right. I think if you're just bullshitting, you're not hurting nobody. Um, when I think about like, like silly, like, well, I'm trying to think, there's a movie that came out. Love it. It's amazing. It's called uh, Hundreds of Beavers. Okay. It's about a dude who's hunting hundreds of beavers. It's a silent picture. It only had like one line of dialogue. Uh, and it, it was a silly movie. It was just silly. It was so dope. It was silly. Um, and it was so valid. And I, I found it extremely enlightening. And uh, it was romantic and fun. Yeah. And I, I didn't walk away with any moral lesson. And I, I, I'm not sure. I don't think I walked away a better person. But I was happier. Uh, <laughs> I, I think there's some media that is dangerous and hurtful. Mm -hmm. 
and us as viewers and us as makers need to do our best to try not to let society and those conversations uh, permeate to the point of self-destruction. I think we have a responsibility there, but generally, you know, like I like 21 Savage, like I like too short. I was talking to, I was talking to a homie once and I was like, Oh, I really love this uh, Bukowski book. And he's like, man, Bukowski is a misogynist. So I was like, dog, you are bumping too short right now. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, well, you know, like I can't listen to little B and Charles Bukowski at the same time. I got to pick my, pick my lanes. <laughs> and I was like, all right, cool. That works for you. <laughs> um, but actively there are artists that I won't listen to because I do think that the yeah. damage outweighs any kind of pleasure or insight I can get out of it. And that's a journey and a question that we have to make as artists and as consumers. And I try not to be judgmental of folks who I may not agree with who have made that decision. But like, I, I don't think I'm overly romantic about uh, the work that I make. And no. I will say this about the work that I make. I think it's smart. I think it's cool. I think it's funny, but I could give you a book list in 30 seconds. That would be more insightful than a book that I'm working on it for seven years. And that's just the way the world works. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, it, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, I, I might get a little, and I, and I think some, some folks run into this and the thing is almost believing your, your own bullshit. You're almost, almost believing in the bullshit that surrounds you. And, you know, any sort of acknowledgement, any sort of like, you know, like as we we're talking, I got this giant billboard in the city and it's just like, oh, and then people think that that's, wow, you're doing something. And I was just like, I just had some money and I just got a billboard yeah. and I'm kind of petty and I put it in an arts district where people who act like I don't exist will see it. So they know I exist. It's, it's, yeah. it's funny. And, you know, it, it's this sort of thing where, how can I put it? Like when you're. You're, you're working on your your sort of thing. You're, you're making it happen. And you have people tell you, oh, this is a good episode. This was this. This was that. This sort of engagement, that feedback. I play games with it. I'm like, yeah, I'm the truth in this art guy. I'm, you know, H-less celebrity. I, I, I do these different things because I don't want to take this stuff serious. And I find, like, people... You know, in the, in something that effectively, as you you've touched on, it's a disposable nature to it. It's a sort of non serious nature to it, and people get so serious. Like, be serious about what you're making. Be serious about why you're making it, and all of that. But when it's just like, as an artiste, it's like less less of that. You know, have fun with it. Yeah, I, I went on a, a bit of a diatribe about something like this and someone, you know, when you say it's something for a long period of time and someone makes a sentence, just one sentence that sums it up so perfectly. Sure. Uh, I, I went on a, 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 a diatribe about this and they responded. They're like, so uh, you, you're saying take your work seriously, but don't take yourself seriously. And I was like, boom, mm -hmm. that's it. Take yeah. your work seriously. Don't take yourself seriously. So. Let me move into these last two questions before I hit you with the rapid fire ones. Right. All right. Um, this is this is in that that these these next two actually in this sort of same vein in this direction we've gone into. Um, I, I've heard sort of roots of this term, so it might be a better term to use for, but for simplicity's sake, I'll use it. Have you experienced imposter syndrome, and how do you overcome it, or how did you overcome it, and how do you address it if you encounter it? Yeah, I'll say I experienced imposter syndrome. I mean. I think for me, I perpetually feel imposter syndrome. I'm just uncomfortable. Uh, <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> so I think uh, when I make art, like, you know how people say that they, they try to get to a style. I'm dramatically avoiding a style at any cost. A lot of my work looks different from them, each other. Mm -hmm. So you could look at my hyper word work. It does look, work. It doesn't look like children and heath and it doesn't look like that old english that old english i did a lot of research i looked into um floyd godferson's work with uh, mickey mouse carl bark's work with donald duck i looked in paul murray's uh work with mickey mouse and a lot of his notes about how to uh, draw in a very specific aesthetic um i looked at uh, a lot of different artists for this new book that i'm working on uh uh, this is Columbus, not where the fuck you come from, uh, which is focused in on kind of creating a zine where like uh, I, I've been saying I, I wanted it to look like I smashed my hand in a car door. And so I wanted it to just like like look like all over the place and chaotic. And so I had to practice how to draw different. Um, and so 
actively every time I go into a project after researching it and trying something new, I feel the intense fear of failure. And I think a lot of that comes from uh, coming from an arts background where uh, this is not necessarily how it works. This is going to be very uh, like binary something where it's like, uh, but in my head with illustration, when I do an illustration job, it's me making a promise that I can do what I've done before again. Yeah. And with uh, with fine art in my mind, it is perpetual exploration and a high risk of failure. Mm. And for when I approach making comics, I, I don't know what it is. I need this high risk of failure. Mm. And so I'm making something and I don't know what it's going to look like at the end. I don't know what that aesthetic is going to look like. And I, I also know that there's this point where I'm like, oh, my God, do I have to commit to this aesthetic? Because I've been drawn this way for 10 pages yeah. and I found a new way to do this. And so I would say that the imposter syndrome is something that perpetually comes out of not existing in my comfort zone and perpetually wanting to surprise myself. But that comes with a degree, a degree of anxiety and concern. Like I become less uh, aware of what I what my deadlines are going to look like when I'm experimenting. I was less likely to experiment when I was working with hyper allergic because I had them deadlines and I'm like, mm, I'm making everybody a silhouette and the character looks like me. I was like, I got to make this easy. <laughs> Nothing <laughs> but playing on easy mode. But like with a lot of my personal projects, I'm like, am I supposed to be the person writing the story? Is this my story to tell? Is this my voice? What is what is going on? And so I, I live in that place of uh, imposter syndrome. I, 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 I bought real estate. I got a, a coat rack over there. I, I'm, I'm subletting, I think. Um, and, <laughs> you know, I, I, I encounter in doing this, like, a, you know, I mentioned earlier the, the, the number we're, we're approaching. And I try not to have the same conversation. I try not to just keep sort of hand questions. And I was like, well, you know, Craig's an artist and does comics. So let me just ask these same questions that I've asked someone else. They're going to be some things that, I'm interested in it might show back up because I'm referencing myself at this point, but they're, you know, each interview, right? Generally, I don't know the people leading into it. So right there, that's why I was saying what I said before we got started of the energy level. We're, we're, we're there, you know what I mean? Yeah. We're at the same spot, <laughs> but you know, there are times when I come in, it's like, yo, you like, wait, hate me, don't you? And, it, and, it's, and it's sort of that. And I'm like, I'm not qualified to do this. Why would they even spend their time talking to me? These are all of the things that run by. And then you hear me sound all silky when I do my introduction and we get into it. Yeah. And, but yeah, so I'm, I'm sub, subletting there. And and part of it is also um, just, it, it's, you, you said it so well. It's just um, the, this thing of like, let me do the thing I know I can do. And, yes. you know, when I'm invited to do this, this, this speaking thing, which, you know, I, I think that there's some artistry to it, but I don't know if it's art per se. I think the the documentation and the the archive component of it, sure, but just the actual act of something different. I when I'm asked to do something that I'm like, I can talk with someone one to one, but in front of a group of people, that's a whole different thing. And I'm, I have to go back to what do I know? And I came to this conclusion a couple years ago when I had to do a talk. No guess. It's just me talking about myself. And I'm like, yo, tell us your art story. I'm like, I got, I don't even know. And I framed it. And I think this comes up in Austin Cleon's book of, you know, he had these like sort of 10 points that he was using for still like an artist and all. I just framed it like, I'm going to interview myself in this. I was like, I know how to interview. And I was like, I'm going to interview myself. And that's going to be the basis of this talk that I'm going to do. Yeah. I find, I find the space of discomfort allows for me to be better at what I do. The times when I'm at my worst are the times I'm at my most comfortable. Where I'm just like, I know what I'm doing. I'm fine. I am I ain't got nothing to worry about. And I walk out there and I'm like, all right, so I did not prepare. <laughs> <laughs> I walked outside oh, no. and got hit by a car. <laughs> <laughs> like times when I'm freaking out, I'm like, wait, do I have my slide? Wait, well, hold on. Did I, did I? Is this the old slide or the new slide? Wait, okay, so wait. Are they going to introduce me? Wait, did I ask somebody to give me a time, like 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 a signal when I'm when I'm off stage? Because of, oh oh, I'm about to interview this person. Is this a dumb question? Oh man, I think this might be a touchy subject. Wait, and it's like all of those concerns, all of that anxiety, creates this like superpower situation where I will walk into a space, and I'm just really good at just being like, 
just doing this while in my head, chaos, pure chaos. I'm like, all right. <laughs> Yeah, we're doing it. Um, compartmentalizing, <laughs> compartmentalized Craig. <laughs> it's just like, yeah. ah, we're out here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So so here, here's the last one. And I think it's a good uh, companion piece to that previous question. A nice little dovetailing here. So, you know, I, I think I, I realize at times when we, we have folks that are artists, folks that are living that creative life, the life part is, is capitalized. So I'm going to frame it in this way. What's a life lesson that you've learned that really helps you cope with some of the challenges and, and limitations of living this creative life? An important thing for me was to learn that light, uh, like being an artist, no matter how good I am or how successful I am, was not going to fix everything. Hmm. And like there are these truisms where like we know, right? It's like when you tell a kid, you know, like, hey, you know, don't. I don't know, brush your teeth every day or you're going to get gingivitis. <laughs> like, they know that. That doesn't mean they're going to brush their teeth every day. Um, horrible metaphor, uh, but like, point made. <laughs> uh, I, I would say that no matter, it took, like, living it. It took me finishing work. It took me, like, like I had to work on my relationship with my parents. I have to uh, pay my bills. I have to make sure I show up to work in, on time. I have to make sure that the people in my life are taken care of. Um, I have to exist as a human being. And no matter how good I am at art, how, how well I do, it will not fix those problems. Right. Missing like my niece's recital I can't go to her in, in 10 years and be like, yo, I wasn't there for your childhood, but I made this book and it was dope. Right. Ah, ah, I got you some autographs from your favorite cartoonists. Forgive me. It's like, you just, you have to exist. Yeah. You can't avoid your existence. And I think that a lot of people think that there are these things you could do that will supplement having to exist. But like existence is like cool. It's pretty chill. Uh, I recommend it. Uh, <laughs> like sometimes, like because sometimes it just gets hard, and like you might want to make art to escape, and you could do that for a little bit. But yeah. like you still have to live. Uh, you might want to uh, if you if you just like got got that residency, that art residency and that professorship. Maybe your parents won't look at you crazy because you're a cartoonist. <laughs> They still don't look at you crazy. They got so many reasons to look at you crazy. <laughs> look at you all sorts of sideways. It it was never one thing. <laughs> and you're still gonna have to go on dates. You're still gonna have to be a parent if you choose that you know path. You're still gonna have to exist. And being an artist is a caveat. Yeah. It's a part. Of it. it ain't the whole shebang and bang. So that was, I think, a big thing for me. Like huge. Thank you. No, that's, that's good. That's good. I, I think that's one for people to check in and on and, and consider because it's it's those things that are that are connected and you have to be a person. I forget that at times. I forget those those different things. And I'm, you know, a time thief. I'm juggling time. I'm as I was saying, the multiple identities that I'm operating within. And, you know, sometimes you gotta have those things and you know, as a person that's a pretty productive individual, very industrious, if you will, um, trying to have those breaks and those periods, as I was describing before we got started, you know, I'm like, I'm going to take a week off, like intentionally, I'm not recording anything because yeah. I got to think of things of like, what kind of question is this going to be? Why do I care about this person? Should I actually do this interview? Things of that nature. And I think that sort of exercise and that consideration should be applied through a lot of folks because you know there's this notion of whatever the bag looks like whether it's a literal bag of money chase it chase it chase it and it can't always be that way because burnout and the 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 i remember when i was in new york there were always events and there was these little moments and i was like oh i can't go because i got work i can't go because of this I can't, rem I remember those events. I don't remember what I missed them for. Mm. And that sticks with me. Like I, I have students and I'll be, they'll be like, yo, I can't go to, you know, meet this author, this writer. I really want to go to this event, the speaker. Uh, I can't go to this networking event. And like, there are a lot of them. 
and you don't necessarily know which one is going to be the thing that you needed. Yeah. But it might be the thing that you missed that you needed that day. And I, I, I just always say, just pause, really reflect and think about what that value is. Mm-hmm. And because at some point they're going to be a thing and you can't make it to everything. You can't do everything, you know? And it, and I know for some people like, they're like, this is why I got to quit my job so that I can make it to our, every artist talk. <laughs> you have to make some really serious decisions, but like actively some people, will miss everything so that they can make every job so that they don't walk away with like debt, which is a choice you make. Sure. But then you walk away from school and wonder why you went because <laughs> you don't have those moments. I, I took, and and, and I'll, I'll close on this before going into these rapid fire questions. I, I took one of those lessons because, you know, you do this circle of friends. And I remember a lot, like a lot of people when we were watching me and my partner were watching uh, the last dance and she was like, in your circle of friends, she was like, I'm going to say who you are. Take from it what you will. And I was like, you're going to say I'm Jordan, aren't you? She was like, you are. And I was like, I'll take it. He's an Aquarius. I'm an Aquarius. Let's go. And I was like, I'm always dissing these white boys. Not really, but still. Um, and, and, and it's one of the things that, you know, I, I use it. You know, if you follow me on social, I use it. I use the I took a personal meme all the time because yeah. <laughs> look, <I'm laughs> one of your neighborhood, my guy, to show you what's what. But um, it was one thing that really stuck out that that, that he said in the, the doc, and it was about sort of his personality around winning. You know that whole thing. If you if you want to if you want to win that way, you you can. But you know, basically, he seems it seems like there's a lot of remorse there. Yeah. And I think that that's something to really kind of look at. Like, I got to a point where I was like, if trying to do everything, trying to go to every event, trying to juggle multiple things. And I was like, no, I got to number this and take what comes with it, take the losses that come with it. Yeah. So, you know, I might be able to do this event and that event. Sometimes those events happen at the same time. Yes. And, you know, you just have to really think those things through and then accept what comes with it. Like sometimes it's proximity, you know, but really when you, you have that sort of real life day job, then art life that sometimes they bump up against each other. You got to really, you know, consider those. Well, and I, I would say that, like, actively, I had the luxury of going to uh, college when I when did I hit that, like, 25. So a lot of my peers were younger than me. And yeah. I'd gotten out of the Marine Corps. So I was in the military. And so as far as being able to identify my relationship with what I was looking for and what I needed, um, you know, when you first go to college, for a lot of students, that's the first time away from home. Yeah. And, like, life might feel super intense for me i i was like i struggled yeah. i've been poor and i was in the marine corps and so i can make some of those choices because i know myself i didn't have to go through that process at the same time yeah. uh so i keep that in mind you know sometimes being young is is it's it's rough it's rough so yeah yeah, no, no, that's 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 great. That's a great way to close that out, especially with your your education background as well. You know, kind of tying like, yeah, man, it's young. Being young is rough. It's a challenge. It's and you because you never know. You don't know how rough it is because you ain't been old yet. <laughs> <laughs> so let me let me hit you with these rapid fire questions. I got three of them for you. And right. as I tell everyone, don't overthink these. These these are just regular questions. Cool. All right. So here's the first one. Um what is your favorite color? And both of these words that I'm asking as far as favorite color, both of them have a U in there. So I'm pinky extended. Favorite with a U, color with a U. I'm going to go with purple. Now, the uh, reason I'm going for purple is uh, I remember watching this movie. I can't remember the artist's name, talking about specific colors. And I identified as purple as the, uh, the, as the color without function. Hmm. And it, historically, I was I bought into that. But then I realized something. I, after uh, seeing uh, Insecure, <laughs> after seeing Moonlight, I was like, purple is black. Purple is black. And it reshaped the way I approached art, the way that I engaged with art, and the color purple changed my life. Okay. What was the other question? I forgot that one. No. Just, yeah. that was just, it? Okay, cool. Yeah, favorite color, just both were used. Cool. I thought there was a second part. I was cool. just being bougie with it. Uh, here's, here's the next one. Here's the next one. Um, 
I'm going to save this one. I'm going to save this one. I'm going to ask you a different one. I'm going to save this one for a second because I think I think this is a good one that, to, to end on. So I'm curious about sort of habits and routines of artists. Um, what is like a regular or common meal that you have? It could be a snack, but a, but something that you're regularly eating. All right. Ooh, so vulnerable. Wow. Wow. All right. Uh, I would say I'm pretty inconsistent. I like to observe my diet and actively get into the routine of diet. So one year I ate so many lentils, you wouldn't believe. Just like curried lentil all day, every day. That was my catch-up meal. Last year would have been straight up sushi. This year I live next to a barbecue spot. And though I'm anticipating cutting out the cutting back on meat, that has become like just straight up just ribs, just straight up ribs, 100% ribs. That is my safety meal right now, 100% ribs. I go there, get three bones. It's like over here eating like the Brontosaurus burger, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know Flintstone ribs. Yeah, uh, no, nah, it's it, they hit. Uh, and if you go there regularly enough, they show you a little bit of extra love, you know, a little bit extra. What was that, Chris Rock bit? <laughs> <laughs> Get one, one rib, rib. <laughs> one rib. <laughs> so, so, so I'm assuming this is this last question. I'm assuming that you watched X Men '97. Yes. So, in that, you know, that's one of those properties. I didn't that, finish it. I'm, I'm not going to spoil. It. I'm not one of those guys. Right. But you know, it's one of those things that you no, know, this came back. You know, this yes. is the continuation. So, for you, you know. You're, you're a pop culture guy. You have the, you know, self-described, you're, you're, you're a weird guy. You got some interests and yeah. um, you're, you're a cartoon guy. You, you're, you're a super talented artist. If someone approached you with, um, hey, we want you to revive this. It could be re something that's regular, rel relative, like live action media. It could be something that's animated. What would be that property that has existed and they want to revive it with you at the helm, showrunner style? Which, what is the show? See, this is what's frustrating about this question is that I've thought about it and you got me in like a karaoke moment where it's just like, yo, what's your song? I'm like, I got a song that I've been wanting to sing, but I can't remember. So I'm going to just go with like this random song I always do. So, I mean, my my song. The, oh, all right. The one I always do has always been the question. DC Comics. Nice. I really enjoy the question. Um, I think. uh, uh like the work that's been done with it has been amazing. And I, I would love to be a part of that legacy. And I think that there'd be fun stuff to do with it. Um, I think uh, if I were to go with X-Men, uh, I think I'd want to go with uh, Cypher. I think okay. that having uh, just a character who can speak every language, this probably has something to do with the fact that my book, That Old English, does the inverse. Yeah. Where it limits the amount of languages people can speak. Uh, the idea of writing a story that's focused on just a person who could learn every language and what to do with that would be uh, interesting. Um, I feel like there is something that has been on my head recently. Oh, Bizarro from Superman. Yeah, go on. So this is never going to be made. So I'm going to just pitch this to you. Great. Uh, I would love a story that was about the alt-right using Bizarro as a metaphor and the idea that there are... Uh, uh, a group of uh, a population that are bizarro versions of themselves, like an uh, 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 invasion of the body snatchers, yeah. except it was bizarro people invading Earth, and they would just take everything and subvert it and undercut it, yeah. and then they had like a, a bunch of control over different media outlets, and so you would have a, a political problem with uh, bizarro people that mm -hmm. existed throughout the population. That would work. No, so so you said this is not going to be made? Nah, I'm mean, I'm not going to get no Superman. You know, if I make this, if I make this in in twenty thirty years when I'm Jack Kirby old, people will have to dig through all the podcasts to find this interview. <laughs> and be like, he said once, long long ago, he wanted to write a Bizarro story. That's why it sounds like 2000. And why does this story sound like 2016? Because that's when he thought of it. There's a podcast. <laughs> he was on this H list celebrities podcast. And I mean, I if if I were in it, is I always like to like throw these in. If I were in it, I I, I have taste. I don't know if I have talent, but I have taste. And I would say, Joe, just just give me love craft country. Just let love me Cracker? let me do that better for y'all. I mean, let yeah, me yeah. fix that for y'all. And, uh, and I'm saying it with stank on it. Let me fix that for y'all. Oh, no, no, I agree. I think there's things you could do. Uh, oh, man. 
See, I'm, I'm this this is a podcast in of itself. Mm-hmm. But like like if we were talking about films, talking because I feel like oh, there was a story. Uh, like okay, so this would have to be a parody, um, Mary Poppins, but um, but Mary Poppins is black. Okay. Okay. I feel like there's a way to really permeate a conversation about race in the early 1920s using uh, Mary Poppins uh, as this uh, allegorical character sure. and Burke too. So you have these uh, like because there was clearly a class conversation in Mary Poppins about poor people taking care of rich people's kids. And so as far as undercutting the narrative of uh, the nanny. Mm-hmm. In black narratives, especially period pieces, I think Mary Poppins would be a fun story to engage with that. And the music could be better. OK, it's hard for me to say the music could be better because I love me some Mary Poppins. But like <laughs> I, I was a kid in front of that TV playing Let's Go Fly Kite on loop. Uh, <laughs> I just want a trap beat. To, no, I don't want a trap beat, actually, just a pop up at Marie Poppins. I just don't want that. <laughs> I think there's something that the right artist, the right voice. Yeah. Could do something. Call Ryan Coogler. See if he got something. <laughs> <laughs> Need the big Cougs to get on. Um, Yo, Cougs could do it. <laughs> I don't think there's not much he can do, actually. Um, so that's kind of it for the pod. Um, I want to, one, I want to do, do two things here in these final moments. One, I want to thank you so much for coming on and spending some time with me. This has been just loads and loads of fun. And, yeah. and two, I want to invite and encourage you to share with the listeners who are uninitiated uh, where they can check you out, social media, website, all that good stuff. The floor is yours. All right. So uh, on Instagram, uh, at M-R-C-P-L-C-R-A-I-G, Mr. Corporal Craig is the the where I, that comes from. A uh, little military reference. You could tell when I made that IG. Uh, <laughs> uh, also, if you wanted to find me on my website, it's uh, cmcampbellart.com. Um, I have another website, which is a fine arts website that I think is just kind of funny. You can find my artist statement there. It's uh, craigwho.com. So you can see some of the work that I've done in art curation. Some of my uh, favorite works that I've done has been curating art shows. Um, I wish y'all could have experienced it, but if you were curious about what that was, you can find it on that website. Um, Also uh, check out the homie uh, Adam Roberts, uh, who is doing it big. He's done work for Vera. and he publishes work under my uh, website under CMC Comics. Uh, I feel like those are the big ones. Those are the heavy hitter, right? Yeah. Well, there you have it, folks. I want to again thank the great, the super talented, the funny Craig Campbell for coming on to the podcast. And I'm Rob Lee saying that there's art, culture, and community in and around your neck of the woods. You've just got to look for it. Mm-hmm.